Hello, my name is Sam and I'll be your host for today. Welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Days. We're going to be talking about reptiles and amphibians in my West Raleigh neighborhood with John Gerwin. And we have a question for you. What is your favorite herp or reptile or amphibian that you found in your backyard or neighborhood? Feel free to type in chat. What is your favorite herp that you found locally? Um, captions will be available for this program and they are separate from the video. So we will be posting a link to the closed captioning in the chat. And this program is being recorded and will be posted to our Reptile and Amphibian Days homepage if you want to check back and see the different species that John is talking about today. And if you have any questions, and again, want to answer our question, uh, please type them in chat and we'll be answering either in the chat or aloud if we have time. All right, so with that, I am in, excited to introduce our speaker, John Gerwin. John is a research curator and educator of ornithology at the Museum of Natural Sciences, and he's been working at the museum for 32 years. In his spare time, he studies most everything else in nature, fungi, butterflies, dragonflies, bumblebees, and of course, reptiles and amphibians. He's a naturalist at heart, and for today's program, he will show us the variety of herps he has found during his 15 years in one rest west Raleigh neighborhood. Thanks so much for speaking with us today, John, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and do the share screen. Get it onto the big screen, there we go. Thanks everybody for coming out online to hear the program. Yep, I guess I do birds for a living, but in my spare time, I like to do all these other things and <clears throat> really excited to show you that I find in my neighborhood. And I just like to point out that I carry around with me a point and shoot camera. I do a lot of walking with our dog or just out exploring at night. And <clears throat> I just carry a camera with me. A lot of people can carry a smartphone, but you can get a lot of good shots with really simple technology. So here's where I live <clears throat> on the left, just a photo of our neighborhood. So if you're not familiar with this area, so I'm in Wake County, it is in the Piedmont. And our area is pretty similar to a lot of other neighborhoods in a lot of other cities, urban towns. Here's um, a street that goes by some city parks. This property here is Powell Community Park. I have a little garden plot here. There's a little pond. Up the way is another city plot. And um, we have a garden club and we monitor these two sites and do some native plant gardening <laughs> as volunteers with the city. But you can see it's just a lot of trees. There are little creeks that run through these areas. They flow into like this pond. And then just south of here, about four or five blocks, is my street, Ravenwood. And amazingly enough, I ended up on a street with a bird name in it. And across the street from us is a lake. So that helps to attract a few reptiles and amphibians as well. But again, you can see it's a lot of mix of either deciduous trees here, and you've got some the darker green here, the pine trees mixed in. So a lot of canopy and a lot of grass, but I do a lot of landscaping in the yard for wildlife. So what is that kind of landscaping? One of the things is just to put out a bunch, leave, let the leaves accumulate. We have a lot of plantings around. I put brush piles out. I will pick up Christmas trees after the Christmas holidays and put a few trees out. And these are, these are habitat for a variety of critters, as well as you can see this little snake here in the pile, in the middle of the brush pile here, a little garter snake. So things like this you can do in your yard. I get questions about how to look for things because people are aware that some things like snakes, you don't wanna be surprised. And the way to do it, the way I do it is I get behind say a given log or a rock and then I pull it toward me. And that way I'm looking over. So if there's something down here that's gonna come zipping out and might scare you, it's gonna go this way away from you. You don't wanna be standing over here looking up at it. Um, so whether it's a log or whether it's a rock, this is how I do it. If I'm in a creek, on the other hand, a slow moving waterway, I will get on the sort of the downstream side and then I will push up and let the water swirl around because then the, uh, for, for, for the first few seconds, it's kind of cloudy water. And I just stand there and slowly let the water pull the uh, silt away. And then as the water clears off, I, I'll be able to see what's underneath it. But in that case, it's usually like a frog or a salamander. I'm just trying to see what's underneath. In general, so on land, I'm on the backside and I pull the log toward me. So as you plant things and do things in your yard, you can end up with a lot of cool critters in your yard. On my street alone, well over now, 
a hundred species. I'm up to about 150 just on our on our street. Um, I've gone from 10 to 40 species of butterflies. Lots of fungi, lots of plants that I've planted, but others that are that were there when I moved in. Um, and then lot, that brings in a lot of pollinators, and all these things are food for reptiles and amphibians. So it's a little bit of a ecosystem have going on out there. Now, when I'm attracting things or whenever any of us are attracting things, inevitably we attract some things we might not wish we had attract, uh, attracted. Uh, not everybody likes, for example, snakes and spiders generate a bit of fear. Not everybody fond of bats. I love having all these things around, so I'm glad to provide a home for them. But, you know, just to point out that we get things we don't always want. Not everybody's happy to have geese walking around. They do make a mess. Um, I find them all interesting. And <clears throat> as part of my job at the museum, I work with a couple of youth groups and I work with Wake Audubon Society. We have a youth group and I love getting them outside and showing them and things in nature and interacting. And I find that uh, the young people are actually eager to interact and, the, and doing it safely. And, um, but also without really without fear, we, they tend to learn things from the adults, learn to be afraid of things they don't necessarily need to be afraid of there's a time and a place but here they are checking out a little snake on the log here and um here's emma holding a, a rat snake and these these things can be done safely so it's a great way to get folks in, involved with nature <clears throat> um one other way that uh, we find ourselves involved with nature is with roadkill so i do see a lot of things hit by cars it's unfortunate um and it's really inevitable. I'm, I'm forever moving frogs and snakes and things off of our street, but it's a lot to keep up with. On a rainy night, you get a lot of things moving and we're on a dead end street and I'm still surprised at how many things get run over. So here's a, a bullfrog that was run over. Um, but one thing you can do if you're inclined is to pick up these sorts of things and uh, put them in the ground, say in a wire cage and you can get uh, the bugs, the worms and beetles will come in and clean the meat off and you can look at the bones afterwards. So I'll start with one of the most popular ones out there. And that this is a box turtle that I followed for a number of years, so to speak, I was forever moving this one. Uh, I think I, I think I saw her over a six year period at, at our busy intersection, our street comes out to another street. And there's a lot of traffic at that intersection. I was always surprised that thing would be out there right in the bend in the road making it a little bit tricky but um over time developed these little marks on the carapace i could tell was the same one they live a pretty long time and uh, but anyway like i said it was over a number six or seven years that this thing hung around in a little woodlot on the corner of our two streets <clears throat> and uh, the the box turtle is a land tortoise really and now if we go into the water so in our lake we get painted turtles and they're adorable. These uh, get their name from the stripes on the head. Here it's red, yellow with a fading sort of orangey in between. And <clears throat> they will come up on land to lay eggs. So during the uh, late spring, I see these, uh, see these coming up a lot on the side of our street over there on the lakeside. It's a buffer, a lot of uh, the areas that there's a wide strip of grass anywhere from the neighbors have it from three to six feet. And the turtles are always up there digging their nest holes and laying eggs. The other turtle I see come up from the lake and lay eggs, not only in that buffer, but all the way over into people's yards is the yellow bellied sliders. Anywhere you have a larger body of water, you'll get sliders. The, the name comes from this, the yellow belly, but they have really uh, detailed fine markings on the carapace. <clears throat> The biggest turtle we see around uh, is the common snapping turtle. So uh, this guy's pretty big. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see it in the little pond at the Powell Community Park. That's not a very big pond. It's probably a, a, in, in length, I would say 120 feet and only about 40 feet wide. That's not a very big pond. But this is a pretty big turtle that was swimming around in it. Uh, we normally see him in our lake, which is several acres of water. But they do move around. A lot of these reptiles and amphibians have a way of moving. I'll, you know, I'll show you some other shots in a minute of things that are, are far away from water or they are in, a, in places that we didn't expect them, but they do get around. Um, and I'm always surprised at, at, to see a snapping turtle lumbering down 
the road, but they actually do fairly well doing so. Another couple of turtles that like that live a more aquatic lifestyle, the mud turtle and the musk turtle. They're pretty similar looking. This is the mud turtle, pretty smooth carapace. These guys are, again, these and the musk are built for water. So they have some webbing in their back toes, especially when you see the musk turtle, good for swimming. These guys have a pretty um, comical looking face. So we'll look at the musk turtle. Here's a musk turtle. Again, take a look at their back feet for good for swimming. And underneath on a musk turtle, you get uh, some pretty strong markings on the plastron if you happen to get a chance to turn one over. These are small. They're, they're smaller than the box turtle. They, they often smaller than the painted turtle. I've seen some fairly small painted turtle, but not much bigger than say the size of my, my hand. <clears throat> Coming further on shore, there are a couple of uh, lizards that hang around in our area. I've seen five line skinks a few times in the yard. This one, um, as you can probably tell, it was on the on our house right here on the bricks on the in the background. Uh, I came out and there he was, hanging out and uh, able to pick him up. There's two species that look very similar. One is called the southeastern five line skink. You have to count scales under their tail, which um, I don't usually bother with. I just call them all five line skink. I'm happy to have them around. The younger ones with the bluish tail are really beautiful animal um, as they some as they get older will look like this here's an older male um, not at all like this one on the left but that can be a little confusing so again there's variation between sometimes between male and female or old and young or it's just general variation we'll see some toads that um, one species of toad can look like three depending on you know which individual you find There's a ground skink. I guess I said there were two, two species, but there's a third one. I haven't seen it in the yard. They're usually in larger woodlots. So I see them nearby. They're in the leaf litter. It's not a very, this one's not very large. These guys are anywhere from say three to four. <clears throat> Maybe they get the five inches, but it's a, it's a dainty one. And it is a, it's, a, it's food for a lot of other creatures, including other larger skinks or, or snakes, uh, birds, all sorts of things feed on ground skinks. They're in the hardwood, particularly in the hardwood leaf litter, and they blend right in. And then the really popular one, uh, what I was really thinking of with number, when I said there were two lizards around is the, um, the green or the Carolina knoll. Pretty popular in the pet trade. And uh, I'm sure a lot of folks have had one at one point in time, but they're also pretty adaptable in different settings. And although I haven't seen it on our street, um, I see them nearby. They seem to be kind of spotty in the Wake County area, but in some places they can be pretty regular. And even just to the west and just to the east, I see them much more regularly. And then there are a number of salamanders around, <clears throat> and I've only um, found a, a couple myself, and I had some neighbors that sent me some photos of ones that they found. Um, this one on the left, um, my colleague at the museum, Jeff, who uh, has sent me some photos as well, um, and he's co-authored a book on the herp, reptiles and amphibians of North Carolina. He told me this is a Chamberlain dwarf salamander. It's interesting. It looks a lot like the two-line salamander. And this one's much, much less common. So I was, I'm always surprised to find something like that in an urban setting. But just goes to show that we have these little creeks and little streams and little woodlots and when we provide these little patches of habitat, and if they're not too polluted, then we'll have things like like this around. So we do see two lined around, but um, I was just, I was surprised to find this one. So you can see they look pretty similar. And then here's a young two line that <clears throat> one of my neighbors, she sent me the photo. She and her husband have a nice little garden in the front and back. They do a lot of native plant gardening and they have a little pond too. They have a little water element. Um, I also maintain one in our front yard, just a little five by five pond. Uh, it, and, and I put a lot of plants and containers in it. It attracts a variety of arthropods as well as frogs and things. But she, uh, she and her husband found this two line salamander and uh, it turns out it's a young one. So you can see they look pretty different in the young, in the larval stage. And then another neighbor sent me these not long ago. She was, uh, 
turning over some logs in her yard with her son and looking for things and found this beautiful little white spotted slimy salamander. It's pretty neat to have one of those in your yard. So again, she's up near the uh, near the Powell Community Park. And there is a little stream that runs into that pond. And I presume that that little bit of water element and then her their yard is full of uh, leaf litter and some pine, mixed pine and oak trees. And so it's a nice little patch of habitat for these guys. But I'm always amazed to have these things show up in our yards. Now, <clears throat> this is from a secret spot. It's a few miles from where I live. And uh, another uh, volunteer of mine is uh, helping to teach a, a class, a natural history class. And uh, they, they were alerted to this spot not too far away to go see these things. And it's a, what a couple of beautiful salamanders. And you can see this and they're getting pretty big here, this spotted salamander. But they are, you know, they are some of the things that, that are caught for the pet trade. So we have to keep these spots secret. But it's nice to know that again, in a pretty urbanized area, which Wake County is, that there are these little patches of, of habitat around. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, from her description, this was in a pretty, pretty urban area. But again, you get the dead end streets or you get these little creeks and you get patches of the wood set aside. And darn if these darn if these critters won't find a way to move in and make a home out of it. So it's pretty neat. So marbled salamander on the left, spotted on the right. So they're laying eggs right now. So you can see there's an egg mass uh, with that one. Pretty neat. And then I'm going to shift over to some frogs. I found quite a few frogs in the neighborhood. Pretty neat to have the variety of species. This is the Cope's gray tree frog. You can see on the left, it's blending in quite nicely with that, the bark of that wild cherry tree, but it also blends in nicely here on the right with the asphalt of our street. And if you look real close, you see a little bit of yellow here. We'll, we'll take a close look at that in just a second. You got to stretch the leg out to see it. Um, but here's one, and again, here's what I talk about variation. You can see this one has much darker markings on the back than the one over here on the right. Just a lot of, you'll see a lot of variation in nature. Here's a close up. So on the left, there's the yellow I was talking about. If you get one, stretch it out. <clears throat> there's the yellow and black on the thighs and the leg. And on the right, just a little close up, adorable face. Grumpy old man like me. <laughs> And uh, here's the first one I ever found on the left. I was so excited to put them on my thumb. Um, and then it seemed like a couple weeks later, I found this one. You can see the yellow showing through on the thigh, but also you notice its eye looks funny. It's because it was missing that eye. Maybe that's why I found it, that couldn't see me sneaking up, but it was, you can see it singing. Um, so two things. One is I'm, these are very, you know, these frogs are, can be pretty vocal. All of them have uh, distinct calls and I have resources at the end websites that I will give you that you can go to and you can hear all the different sounds that these frogs make and it's fun to go out you know it's like bird singing you gotta learn what you're hearing learn the learn the calls and know what species are in your area but here's an example of one that I videoed here it is under the culvert of our street and it was a rainy night and there were probably half a dozen of these calling we'll see if this goes through there we go. You see it's pouch, a sack, the vocal sack coming out. Pretty loud, I like it. Not everybody does like them out their bedroom window at night, but I do. <laughs> I hear about five different individuals in the video singing. It's pretty, uh, it was quite the night. Okay, I guess that's enough. But I'll mention that this guy up here on the left. So <clears throat> I mentioned it was my first one. And um, what I learned in addition to the yellow is I went inside and I uh, took my contacts out. Immediately my left eye began to burn like crazy. And it was, it was, it was hurting. And that's when I learned that gray tree frogs have a toxin in their skin. So that moist skin has a little bit of a toxin and I had not thought about that. So that's another good lesson in one, keep your hands clean for the frog's sake, but also if you're going to handle any of these guys, then you need to wash your hands afterwards as well or wear latex gloves. But um, I forgot, I wasn't thinking, and I you know, went right to my contact lenses and it took an hour, over an hour before the pain 
stopped. It was pretty, it was pretty rough. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a lot more careful now. You learn lessons the hard way sometimes. And John, do we think that the yellow on the legs is indicating that that has that poison? You know, that's a, a good question. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It could be, you know, that kind of warning coloration. It's a little bit hidden, you know, that's the thing. It doesn't really show up until they jump. So I sometimes, I tend to think of those things as being more of a distraction during an evasion. It's like some birds have white spots in their tail that doesn't show up until they fly. It's sort of like, hey, if you're going to look at something, look at this. If you're a predator, don't look at my head because, you know, if it gets, if it chomps on the animal's head, that's the end of it. But, you know, if it grabs something down here, chances are the animal will get away. So that's the, I'm, I'm thinking it, it might be more like that. Whereas some things like these, you know, butterflies, like monarchs that, that are bright orange from the, right from the start, it's sort of a warning coloration. But I'm not sure. I mean, it's a good question. All right, I'm going to skip on down. So, so here's another uh, tree frog, and, and they have a little bit of blue in that area, but, um, but these guys don't have that same uh, skin tox, and they don't have that, that same thing going on. So, you know, it makes me wonder. But um, anyway, there's, um, these have become really common in our neighborhood, in part because that lake is there, but also the lake has silted in a lot, and there's a lot more vegetation now. And I tell you, in the last five years, the population just went crazy. They call all night long in the summer. It's really something to hear those. And uh, we have these uh, cricket frogs over there. It's just really, it's like quadrupled in number. But they also uh, began showing up all over our carport and the back of the house and in the gardens. So here's one on my milkweed plant. We find them all the time now in the garden, whereas we, we didn't find them early on, they just have really expanded. Well, it's really fun to have them around. So, um, and they're not always green. Here's one that was, you know, out on our carport wall and it's brown. There's, again, there's that variation. Most of the time they have this yellowish, off yellow cream colored stripe down the side, but not always as long as this one, sometimes just half or even just a quarter of the length. And here's a few other individuals. Again, they're everywhere. They got the little toe pads here so they can cling all kinds of places while they're out foraging here is on the vehicle. Here's one on our uh, post out by, the, again, by the carport. We have the light on and it attracts insects. Here's one on the mailbox one night. I'm not sure what it was doing there, but they know what they're doing, so. <clears throat> and here's one underneath. And here's one just close up showing the toe pads on the top. And here's the toe pads underneath. If you haven't gotten a chance to look at one, it's pretty cool. I had one on the kitchen window one night and so I got to see it from the other side. This is the original suction cup. So it makes them very good climbers all up and down the wall. So they're now, they're just always on our house, up and down in the carport, behind in the back of the house, and the, like I said, the kitchen window. There is a squirrel tree frog that looks pretty similar. So thanks to Jeff for sending me some photos. Um, you can see it really doesn't have a, the, the line, a little bit different on the head and face, and some of the squirrel tree frogs are even more grayish brown, they're pretty similar. Different vocalization, I, ha um, I haven't found any here in our street, but I have uh, heard them not too far away, just a few mi couple miles away. So getting uh, out of the tree and back on ground are some larger frogs. And this is this little pond we have in our front yard. Just again, it's just a little <clears throat> uh, five by five, uh, really a sack of plastic with water and I, I grow some plants in it and put some of the slate around it and the frogs just love to come and hang out so this is the green frog and the the most of the green it's going to have is right here on its face you can see this one you can see it over here on the left and this one doesn't have much at all but otherwise it's a pretty brown frog but that is big tympanum here where the essentially the ear and here's some other individuals so uh, here's one with the green on the face, the one over here on the left, and the one down here on the lower right, it's just a, it's a young one. And it generally shows some spotting, but sometimes it's a pretty dark brown. But it's, a, you know, it's one of these typical frogs. These guys are like, like three inches or so when they're folded up like this. <clears throat> and then a similar size and uh, and they can get a little bit bigger, up to like four inches. Are um, are the pickerel and the southern leopard frog? These are these are all these three are all to me. They're all kind of similar. 
Uh, the pickerel frog is generally going to be brown with its splotches, and the splotches tend to be more rectangular or square, more, more really distinctive. The southern leopard frog often is green. It can be real green like this one, or it can be just green down the center with a lot of brown on the side. The splotches tend to be smaller and more rounded, not quite as angular. And if you get a good look at the tympanum, the southern leopard has this white spot. So we can take a close-up look at a few of these guys. So here's a pickerel frog, a little bit of a, a younger one, but you can it's still got the bold rectangular squarish marks on the back and the tympanum does not have that white spot. I don't always get to see the tympanum here with a shot. I'm trying to sneak up at night out, out in the front yard and darn if the guy wasn't behind one of my containerized plants, but I was able to reposition, get another look and you can see it does not have the white spot. So. And it's got these pretty rectangular bold markings, so it makes it a, a pickerel frog. And then here's a close-up of southern leopard. You can see on the left, <clears throat> it's a younger one, but it's, it's pretty brown. But again, these spots are more rounded. There's no, uh, he's got the little white spot here in the, in the tympanum. Bold, these folds down the side are pretty bold, but here's one that's just green down the side, down the center. And again, more rounded spots. Um, and, and the vocalizations, all of these things are, are fun to hear. The green, the uh, green frog reminds, reminds people of um, kind of like plucking a banjo. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, some of them will sound like, I guess it's the pickerel, it's a little bit like snoring. I can't remember if that's the one, but the southern leopard has a real deep sound too. Uh, anyway, real interesting sounds. I'll hear them outside my uh, office window at night, when, especially when it's humid or it's been raining a little bit and they're vocalizing. And then also around our pond and around the lake, we get bullfrogs. Um, one of the biggest, it is the biggest one that I see in our area and that's got a big, bold uh, 90 degree uh, line on the face behind the tympanum here, but it gets can get to be a very, very large frog. Uh, often they see these bold streaks on the hind legs. Now the bullfrog will eat some of the other little frogs too. So when it gets to be a lot of them in our little pond out front, the green frogs, southern leopard frog kind of disappear for a while. And um, uh, But things kind of go back and forth. And I just, I let them all just kind of figure it out. I'm always surprised that if I have a uh, little, there'll be a, I'll put a little bucket of water out. I'm going to go water some plants and I forget for like a day or two and I'll come back and there'll be a frog inside. I'm just hanging out. They find how they find these little bits of water is amazing to me. I think it's fascinating. <clears throat> Across the street in our lake, I mentioned we have cricket frogs here. They are up close. The northern cricket frog. There's a southern cricket frog. It looks pretty similar. I hear the vocalizations of the ones across the street. I know that they're a northern cricket frog. Pretty warty skin. This is a tiny frog. Here is a, here's one in my hand. A dainty little thing. And then uh, here's one in the leaf litter. If you look closely, <laughs> he's right here, blending in. A little more green on the back, some nice markings on the hind legs. And this is far away from water, this guy. So they do, once they, uh, they breed in the water, I mean, they do like the water, but a lot of these uh, reptiles and amphibians, even though they are water animals, they will move and, and survive in some places pretty far away. This leaf litter holds a lot of moisture. Uh, if you dig into some deep, deep, leaf litter, which is why I like to leave it in our yard. We have, I have five, six inches of leaf litter out back. It traps a lot of moisture and the humidity is really high and these organisms can make a living that way. We have spring peepers uh, in our lake. I haven't caught one yet to, to get a photo. So Jeff was nice enough to send me these great shots. Um, it's one of the most diagnostic frogs I think it's probably one of the most popular in the Eastern US. I mean, everybody knows the spring peeper and people sing about it and that sort of thing. It's known by it's this cross on the back. It's a small, small little frog and um, they should be singing right now. And then we'll switch over to toads. <clears throat> they also like the water, um, but we I see them all the time out on our street or in our carport. This is the American toad. <laughs> These guys have fewer of these warts, fewer of them within their dark spots on their backs, so like one to two warts you'll see versus something like the Fowler's toad, which usually has three or four. But as I mentioned, the variation. So here's one that 
you know, pretty pale, <clears throat> pale splotching. This one's got the reddish brown tint. This next one is very gray. Here you can see it's just got a couple of spots and a couple of warts inside the spot. And they're, they're big, puffy things. And then when we look at a, a Fowler's toad, they're very similar, but again, variation. Here, it's, uh, these are uh, just two morphs, two color morphs of Fowler's toad. And um, I'm gonna see if I can enlarge my screen a little bit. I don't know if it'll, does that work at your end? Um, if you look real close, if it's, I don't know if it's showing up, but yeah, if you look real close, you see the little spots there on the Fowler's toad here. See, he's got like four marking, four warts inside his spot. So that's, that's helps separate him from American toad. And of course the vocalization is different. So again, when you learn the vocalizations, you know what you've got that way. And actually I need to, whoops, go back to yours. Go back to your regular size. There we go. <laughs> okay, a little break in the action then, my little humor. <clears throat> um, we will switch, talk about some snakes. And one of the most uh, common and well-known is the black rat snakes. So we see them a lot on our roadways all over uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> and they get to be up to six feet long. So they start off small and they can grow to be a pretty big snake. Then uh, uh, they're black on the back, but they have the black and white <laughs> markings underneath. This is what Emma was holding in the uh, earlier photo. And they're great climbers. So here's one on our <clears throat> banister at Prairie Ridge. And, and then the next shot shows one doing what they do really, really well, which is he's climbing this tree and he's going after a woodpecker nest that's got babies in it. So, and that's the thing that they do is they're very good at finding bird nests and they eat bird eggs and about particularly bird babies. Um, you know, everybody's got to eat. So they're just doing what they do. But it was, we were studying this woodpecker up in the mountains for a couple of years and uh, three or four times we came across rat snakes way up, 40 feet up in a tree. It's amazing that they could detect that there was an active nest in this tree and then be able to scale it. But they have this way of doing their contractions and, uh, and it's, you know, it's very specialized and it's perfect for climbing trees. It's fascinating, fascinating adaptations. And then similar looking is a black racer. And it's a, it's a snake, to, to me, it's more in open meadows and drier areas. And uh, I've seen it twice on my street, same spot, different years. And, and it was always uh, a quick, it was literally racing across the street in front of me. I was unable to get a photo, so I asked Jeff to send me a couple shots. And so he did, it's, a, it's um, dark underneath. It's kind of a bluish gray when when you get a good look in the light or just a dark charcoal uh, dark gray uh, <clears throat> so it doesn't have that speckled black and white all the way down just a little white chin anyway it is a quick moving snake and young black racers and young rat snakes have this pattern they're very you know similar and it's a pattern you find in other snakes like milk snake or corn snake and i'm not able to show every one of them but um but you get, you can, you know, it can be confusing to have a young snake and, and wonder exactly which one it is. But again, there are resources at the end that I'll give you for doing identifications. So another splotchy looking snake in our area, but this one's pretty common is the garter snake, the Eastern garter snake. I see some variation where uh, some have this beautiful sky blue coloration on the back. So it'd be the black spots, but the base color is the sky blue and then the stripe down the middle and uh, really beautiful. And so this is a this is a snake that will show variation. You can see two variants here. This one's got a little bit of an orangish cast in the middle. <clears throat> and then, you know, we live near, we live across from a lake. So we have water. So we're going to have water snakes. Uh, there are water elements around most urban areas. And when there are, you're normally going to have water snakes and in our area we get the northern water snake it's a beautiful adult on the left and um, many people will confuse it with the uh, cotton mouse we don't get those uh, in wake county or west of here they're they're just to the east uh, and here's a younger one on the right but a really beautiful snake and here's the underside of one unfortunately this i found this one dead last spring on our street it's too bad that somebody didn't see it in the road and ran over it um, but it's beautiful, sort of a, you know, a soft yellow color underneath with these chestnut bands. So the banding right here, you can see it's starting to get 
this chestnutty color, and then it wraps around the underside and it's much stronger, really beautiful snake. And here's what a young one looks like. So kind of similar to that racer pattern. Uh, instead of being so gray and black though, it's this uh, warm brown and dark brown, but this is over at the, the Ring Gardens at the Art Museum, the NC Art Museum. So again, where you put in a little bit of water element, you're bound to get some water snakes. And then there are four species of these small brownish snakes in our area. Actually, I guess technically five because the earth snake, there are two of them. And I never really think to, <laughs> I never think to study them enough to, to know which one I have. I generally call them all rough earth snakes, but I'm sure they're both around. There's a difference in how the scales feel because the rough earth snake has some keels on them and you can feel it. Um, but here's one we got in our yard uh, one night or probably off the street. And here's one on a little log. I keep little, uh, I keep these little logs in our yard to, for things like, well, the arthropods and then snakes to come along and have a place to do what they do. So the earth snakes are fun to have around. Here's a close up of one on our street before I moved it. And then here's one you can see next to my wife's shoe. It's a, it's, this is actually kind of a big one and it's a little bit lumpy. It might be uh, with young. And then uh, here's a different one that's uh, more, that's typical. I see them a little bit smaller like this. You can see how, how dainty it is. And then uh, again, I, I'm, I'm forever moving these things off the street. They're pretty docile. These little snakes, they don't really bite. They will musk. Most of these snakes will musk. The garter snake especially will musk. And it's a you know pretty foul smelling thing. It's meant to dissuade any of us or any predator from handling it. But, but these little guys, they, they don't bite. Um, and then here's the brown snake. It's a little bit bigger than a than an earth snake. Um, on the left was with my headlamp, and on the right I used the flash on my camera. You can see you get quite a different view depending on the light source you have. Um, <clears throat> they all these guys are feeding on worms or snails or slugs in the yard. And so here's the brown snake uh, crawling down one of our rocks. One night we have a few decorative rocks in the yard and uh, often there's slugs and snails on this rock and that's what he's going after. <clears throat> and the daintiest one that I have found out there is the worm snake. Um, they have a little shovel nose because they are often underground doing what they do. I have a lot of compost, I have a lot of mulch around and I'm, I'm forever finding them when I dig up in the compost or I'm moving mulch around the yard or I'm digging a hole in the yard to put a new plant in. I do a lot of native plant gardening and I'm digging a hole and I'm forever digging up a worm snake. You can see it's pretty small. This is a young one with the stronger, beautiful salmony color, but they don't get much bigger than this as adults. It's a dainty little snake that specializes on earthworms. And here's a couple more. Uh, this is uh, actually the two of the same, but just showing you the back and here from the side, how strong of a salmon color it can be when they're young. It was really pretty. Uh, this guy wasn't, but about five inches long. And this one is what those girls were looking at in the, in the early slide on the log. It's a red bellied snake and it's also small as you can see. There's a lot of variation in how they look. Some are very gray on the back instead of this brown color, but when you find one, the, the head is a little darker and it's got this whitish cheek patch. Um, and I've only found, I found them nearby. I haven't found one in my yard. I'm sure they're across the street in the woodland buffer around our lake. But these, all these guys tend to come out more at night and during the day they're under the leaf litter, they're under logs and you really have to go looking for them to, to find them. If you're fortunate to find a rough green snake away from vegetation, this is what it will look like and what a gorgeous snake. Now they hang out in vegetation, leave live vegetation. So they look just like the plant that they're in and they're, they blend right in it's pretty hard to tell. And they got this little bit of yellow underneath. So even if you were to <clears throat> see it from underneath against the sunlight, it blends right in. But a gorgeous snake, the rough green snake. But, um, but you can move them because this is a snake that absolutely won't, just will not bite. I know I shouldn't say that, but I have tried to get them to bite me and they just won't. Um, they're very docile. And so they're easy to pick up off the street and move into the nearby woods. What a beautiful snake though. And then everybody's favorite, the co uh, copperhead. <laughs> so <clears throat> we do get them occasionally in the yard. 
uh, even more rarely, thankfully, they come to our little uh, step on out our back door. Um, I always know when there's one around because my wife lets, takes the dog out first thing in the morning. And if I hear a certain scream, I know there's a copperhead waiting for me to go out and move it. But that, but I do. Um, it's not for everyone, you know, it's to do, but I use one of these with the little suction cups. So it's gentle on the snake, but I pick them up, put them in a bucket and take them across the street. Um, I find that if, if when I do disturb them this way, they don't come back. They, they seem to know that they've been found out and they, um, they don't come back. So it's actually only been a, a three or four times that we've had them either in the carport or the yard. Uh, but, that, but I do tend to find them, I find them on the street a lot. It's a common snake in our area. So here's one out on our street in front of our house. It's a younger one. You can see it's got a little bit of yellow here. We'll zoom in on that in a second. Not the youngest of younger though. You know, you can see he's getting to be, it's about 16 inches long. So up close, it's where it gets its name. Beautiful color. I find it to be just one of the most beautiful snakes out there. Just absolutely, that pattern just entrances me every time I see one. I have to get up close and take a photo. I've got so many photos of copperheads. I don't need any more photos, but I, I do it every time. And then, you know, we call them pit vipers and this is why. So here you can see under the under the nose here, the eyes where it is. And here's a, a close up of, of what those are, the heat sensing organ for when it's out foraging, looking for its prey. They're pretty, I mean, for a, you know, for a snake, they're pretty docile actually. And again, I, I don't encourage people to go out and handle these things, but you don't have to uh, panic or anything. They, they are really pretty mellow. When I pick them up and move them, they just kind of lay there most of the time. Here's a couple others. <clears throat> this one was on our street. Um, looks like it's looks like it's going to shed its skin when its eye looks different like that. And this was the one uh, in our yard that I had to move and put it in the bucket. But, you know, kind of blends in with the pine straw and other leaf litter. And then this is uh, what we mean by the yellow on the tail and the young. So here's a very young one. It's a real sulfur yellow. And as they age, then it, it just it's reduced and reduced. And like you can see here, it's a... Um, you can you can generally tell uh, an age of these guys by that amount of yellow. And there he is next to a shoe without a foot in it. And so this one's not but about 12 inches and he's got the pretty strong yellow. And this was uh, it's one of my favorite finds in our neighborhood is the ringneck snake, the eastern ringneck snake. I've only found two and I did not get to photograph the first one and I was it took it was years before I found this one. I was so excited when I I was able to catch this one. I didn't have my camera that night either, but I caught it and I took it home. <laughs> I was like you are not getting away this time. And uh it's beautiful, beautiful. This one just shed. You can see it's so shiny and uh, beautiful yellow underneath. Uh, you know, a lot of these are out at night and, and the ring neck is particularly uh, nocturnal, it seems. And so I, that's pr probably why I don't see them very often. Uh, even though I'm out and I walk in the dog, they're, they're just not as common in our area. And I think I got, yeah, here's a close up. I, it's just this beautiful uh, rainbow pattern where it just shed its skin. It's just gorgeous. So I was, I've always been uh, thrilled that I found this one and got some photos of a dainty little thing. You know, I don't, not very big either, a lot like the uh, rough green snake. They don't get as big as that one, but they're very dainty. And so um, some resources. So that's it for my photos. Are we on time? I forgot to look at my clock. We are on yeah, time. Yeah. All right, good. It's right about 2.45. Right. Yeah. So I'm just going to show you. Um, so we have programs at the museum's outdoors <clears throat> Prairie Ridge Eco Station. Of course, we have our uh, satellite facilities in Whiteville and Greenville. If you're in those parts of the state, you can... Uh, look up online and see what programs we're doing. But we usually have different things that um, will involve reptiles and amphibians. You can also use our Ask a Naturalist website web form here. You can send photos, you can fill out the form and uh, someone like Jeff Bean or Brian Stewart will get back to you with uh, answer. Or we have some of our educators also uh, monitor this and uh, they will answer your questions. And this is the book that our researchers at the museum have co-authored. This is the second edition. So Jeff Bean is our collection manager of herpetology. Alvin is our retired curator. And uh, Bill Palmer's a retired herpetology curator. 
and then you can go to these sites. So these are good sites here, the Herp Atlas, as well as this other one below it. They have all the vocalizations on their website. It's really fun. They have lots of photos and um, you can go and, and see those and see the, um, and hear the audio clip. I like using iNaturalist. I put a lot of my photos of my arthropods, especially into iNaturalist and uh, I keep an account. I'll show you an example in, in next, um, but you can explore it. You don't have to have an account. You can just go on there and look at a lot of photos and a lot of information. There's the, um, there's a new project called NC Biodiversity Project. It's trying to collate all this stuff into one site. And then um, this is what iNaturalist looks like. My account looks like this where I, I put my photos on and there's sort of a artificial intelligence system. It, it will it will provide what it's uh, suggestions for identification. And then I, I zoom in a little bit closer and I say, yeah, yeah, I think it's that one. And I put a name and then other people check it. And if, uh, if like three people agree with you, it becomes what's called research grade. And so it's kind of fun. It's an interactive thing. It's really meant for the general public to use. And there's, it's global. Uh, people all around the world are looking at your photos and chiming in and offering you uh, advice and, and especially things that I don't necessarily know, like the, all the bumblebees or some of the fireflies, a lot of similar species and people will look at my photos and, and help me identify them. It's pretty cool. I was particularly interested when I hit the garter snake one because um, somebody, when I put down Eastern garter snake, somebody said, oh, I think it's a common garter snake. And I was like, wait a minute, what, what do they mean by that? So I went online to look. Um, one thing, iNaturalist gives you a, a seasonal graph based on all the submissions it has, all the data submitted. But here's what I mean by the variation I was talking about in garter snake. And we often refer to these as either a population or a subspecies. And so I took a closer look and here's the taxonomy and you can, you can read all about this on iNaturalist. And here it comes down. And so common garter snake is sort of the, the broad name. And then Eastern garter snake is one of the subspecies. And the person just didn't realize that I actually knew what I was talking about. It's actually an Eastern garter snake. So I'll go back and, and bump it back down to Eastern garter snake. And then here's just another close up. I look underneath common garter snake and all these are different subspecies. But, um, but I know which one we're talking about here in North Carolina. You can see it's the most, one of the most common. So anyway, it's a neat site to play around with. And, um, and that's it. So, and here's uh, a, a, uh, hawk that specializes on eating snakes, the red-shouldered hawk in our area. And it is unfortunately eating that garter snake. So, anyway, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. All right, thank you so much, John. Yeah, we have some great observations in chat of people being like, yeah, we see like anoles and skinks in our yard and oh, prowlers, toads and things. So yeah, thanks so much for helping identify those for us. Um, we had a question from Miss Mitchell's science class, and they were wondering um, why are some snakes so small? Because we didn't know that snakes could be so tiny. Well, you know, you see that a lot, the size variation in all sorts of groups of animals. For example, here we have a hawk, but we also have hummingbirds. And so these things have evolved to occupy different niches in the world, in the natural world. And those snakes can do it because there are a lot of small things out there. And if you haven't, if you haven't done this, if you have access to a, you know, a, a, a wooded area or, or just an, or a meadow that's fairly natural, that's not you know, full of um, chemicals or just grass, but you can go out and explore in the leaf litter, you'd be surprised at all the little critters that are down in there. Uh, snails, they can be just like, one fourth the size of your thumbnail. And there can be hundreds of those. We worked a site in the coastal plain and every time we scooped up a square foot of leaf litter, we probably had a dozen of these tiny snails. So imagine multiplying that over a couple of acres. There were thousands of these little snails out there. And then there are all these little slugs out there. And you know, you just got so many little things out there that these snakes can feed on. So that's how they're able to do it. They don't have to be big because there are lots of little things they can feed on. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had a question if there were, if you had any um, suggestions for how to prevent snakes around your house. Um, well, if to, to, keep us, to keep anything away from the house is to keep the habitat away. 
Um, I think that's sort of the, the easiest thing. You know, I always have to remind myself to go rake the leaves away from the house, partly to just keep the moisture away from the foundation. But the minute the, <laughs> the minute those leaves pile up <clears throat> around the house, you will, you know, you'll get, um, you'll get the worms moving in, you'll get the roaches moving in, uh, you'll get other arthropods moving in in the millipedes, and then that's, that's food for the snake, plus these little snakes like to get in the leaf litter, so it's really uh, things like not, not stocking your uh, wood pile next to your house, and, and just stuff like that, um, really that's, that's the main thing, if you get the occasional snake, that's just bound to happen if they're around, you know, they're just, yeah. they're out there, and they're attracted to the habitat that you have but keeping the stuff immediately off the house will keep them away from the house yeah all right wonderful i think that's basically okay. all i'm seeing for the the questions let me see if there's any other things i had a question for you though did you have a favorite herp that you found or is it can you pick one <laughs> well i do love that ring neck snake that i found i'm still mm -hmm excited about that one yeah i've only seen it twice like i say actually in almost the same area it makes you wonder if it was the same snake that made it it was near where the box turtle used to hang out and um i was just so excited to uh to have found it and be able to get a photo of it i i mean it's one of my that one i mean i like those tree frogs too so but that ring neck snake is kind of my probably my favorite <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. That is something yeah. that I would I would love to find a ring neck snake. That would be so yeah. cool. All right. Okay, great. I'm going to share my slide. I got to stop sharing. There we go. It's all yours. All right. Thank you very much. And um, thank you so much for speaking with us. And um, thank you all for tuning into this talk. We hope you had fun and learned a few native uh, a few new native North Carolinian species. Um, and as, as always, thank you to our museum members who help make events like Reptile and Amphibian Days possible. If you join or renew your membership during this event, you'll get a free Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirt. So, as, as pictured in the slide here. Um, and there are other great programs scheduled for this week too. So we'll post the link to our schedule with how to register for the programs in the chat. And again, this recording will be posted to the Reptile and Amphibian Days program page. So if you wanna check back and rewatch um, and see the different species that John talked about, feel free to do so. And thank you again so much for attending and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.